It is Thursday, July 7th, 2022. This is another edition of Baseball Today presented to you by our friends over at Shady Rays. Not only the best looking shades in the entire business, but when you inevitably lose them or break them, they will replace them. I am Chris Rose, and speaking of being replaced, at least for today, Trevor Plouffe is because he's hanging out on the beaches of Cabo with his beautiful wife and beautiful family. And so we have brought in the voice not only of the Chicago White Sox, but of Peacock on the exclusive Sunday morning slash noon game. I'm a little confused about what time we're into that these days, but we'll talk to Jason Benetti about that and oh so much more. Good to see you, my friend. How are you? Uh, Chris, thank you very much. I, I just have to say before we start that I'm very excited to replace Trevor Blue for one day because when I was in Syracuse in AAA, because he beat us so badly when he was in Rochester, we in the press box referred to him as the ever dangerous Trevor Plouffe. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever heard that. He might want to run that on a loop in his house from now on. That's uh, was he good? He was back good then? against the Syracuse Chiefs all the time. It was like Trevor Plouffe <laughs> came up. There's a ball to the railroad tracks. Like Trevor Plouffe's up. There's a ball to Neptune. Like, great, fantastic. And then, like, he'd go play Buffalo and ground into a double play. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Well, thank you for being here. Um, when we get to the AMP portion of the program, and we want to thank you however you're consuming us, whether it's live on AMP or in our podcast form on our YouTube channel, um, we'll be talking to you about, you know, kind of like your daily prep and how you get through the games with the Chicago White Sox and Steve Stone and then make the transition to Sundays with Peacock, which is a, a real interesting format that I want to dive into a little bit later. But I got to start with this. Whenever Lance Lynn is on the mound, inevitably, we're going to get some sort of crotch grab or something. And yesterday against the Twins, how do you not just chuckle on air when he does this? So that one was like, that was the like very theistic version, right? Like that was the grab and then point to the sky. Like if that, if you're not a religious person, I think you become one at that point. I love it so much. Like I love saying things like he grabs the corner for strike three and sort of uh, other plays on words that I've gotten to work with Liam Hendricks on too, uh, with all of his F-bombs he drops uh, over yeah. the, of the, the ninth inning. But Lance is like, for me, Lance is the perfect Chicago White Sox pitcher. Like you absolutely could go have a beer with Lance Lynn or two or three, and he would totally fit in at any place around that ballpark. And he's like, he's, you know, an Indiana guy. He's mm -hmm. got like the whole like region sound to him even. Like he's got that whole sensibility. I love Lance Lynn as a fit, but yes, uh, quite often <laughs> – our, our crew loves replaying those going to break as well because you can slow it down. And if you have the chance to slow down the, the physical along with the metaphysical and Lance's, um, what he says normally is really good too as he's coming off the mound. So if you get a look uh, from like the low third base camera at what he's saying, it's usually either a message to his team, a message to the other team or a message to the world at large. Expanding that four-letter vocabulary, one crotch grab at a time. I love it. I love it. All right, let's get to our daily dose of baseball today. And we start with the pitching version of Shohei Otani, who was dynamite last night in a win down in Miami. Seven scoreless innings, 10 strikeouts. Jason, he has now gone four straight starts without allowing an earned run. In your opinion, does he have a better shot of winning a Cy Young this year or a league MVP? You know, it's it's interesting because we've we've had the conversation about can pitchers win the MVP before. Right. He has to be able to win both by definition because he is a position player and a starting pitcher. And we all know that. But I do wonder, Otani, say Otani wins the MVP this year and he rattles off a bunch in a row. Will we ever see another starting pitcher win the MVP again? Or does he mm. put the bar at you have to hit as well? So I, I worry that if we see like a one, two ERA season from somebody and he really is the best player in baseball, but he didn't go two ways. Do, does Otani change the bar so much that we never see a pitcher win MVP again? Okay. That's a, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, I'm curious if you had a vote for either award right now and you know, as a broadcaster, you don't. It's a Baseball Writers Association award, and I get that. Would you vote for him for A, the MVP, B, the Cy Young, or C, neither? I'm talking about the top spot. He would get votes, but would you vote him number one in either one of those? 
I, I mean, if I could, I'd, uh, I would vote him for both. I think, I think he's distinctly, about, here's what I will say. I will vote for him for MVP if I have to pick one, because I think there are other pitchers who are deserving of the Cy Young that wouldn't get the touch because he has done both so well. I do think for the Cy Young, you have to take out the hitting stuff. And I think some people might be shrouded by that, but it's mm. got to be like a very ministerial decision that it's only about the pitching. So the MVP award for me is the one that he has the best shot at as I rifle through it in my mind. I, I, I agree. I, hands down. I, I agree. And, uh, you know, I got blasted. I got lit up last week in particular by Yankees Twitter because I said that Shohei Otani was much more important to baseball than Aaron Judge. And people went nuts. And I said, that's not a slight on Aaron Judge. I just said, folks, we have, forget about even comparing him to Babe Ruth. We have never seen this. You're talking about a guy that is going to be either the best or the second best hitter in your order. Like if he got traded in the Yankees right now, the only guy that be be that would be better than him as a hitter is Aaron Judge. If you trade him to the Yankees right now, I think he'd be the best pitcher. Absolutely. Unquestionably. And so I, I think it's like, here's what Otani is going to do to me, is he has already spawned so many conversations at the high school and the college level of guys saying, I want to do both, right? Like, I want to do this. And now it's all these coaches' decisions. Can you or can't you? There are going to be a lot of people who try to be that. But he is, like... I'm sorry that Yankee fans feel that way, right? But mm -hmm. he's going to be the most valuable person, one individual person in baseball until you don't have roster limits. Like if you if you could have 70 guys, Otani doesn't matter as much. But if you get the value of two players out of one guy, just by sheer economic decision-making, like sheer accounting, he's the most valuable player in Major League Baseball if he does both well. That's nothing, like you said, that's nothing against anybody else. But because of roster limits, you you have him and you have an advantage. And so my question is, what are the Angels doing? <laughs> that's that's for another day. We've we've kicked that one down the road so many times. I, I It disgusts me to even bring it up. So I'm going to move on to another topic and a guy who's red hot and a team that's red hot, even though they lost last night. Kyle Schwarber, second straight multi-homer game, now has an NL best 27 big flies. Um, there, there's another portion of the program I want to get to, but where does he rank among the most feared power hitters today, real quickly? Oh, man, that's it's tough to put him anywhere outside the top, like, 12, right? I mean, he's got to be in that category, especially the, the Junes he's had recently. Right, it's amazing. I think he's the type of guy, though, that – I was just talking to a, a, a coach on another team the other day, a bench coach. And so many people in Major League Baseball look at a lineup and say, who can beat me and who can't beat me? And, and Schwarber is that one of those guys in that lineup, especially, you know, with the injury to, to Bryce Harper. Like, Schwarber has got to be that guy for Philly now. And I know in whatever lineup he's in, he's a home run threat that you have to circle. So, yeah, I, I think he's in – the top 12 mm -hmm. I, I I'm sure there are there there's no way there are uh 15 people who are more feared than him as a power hitter in a big spot hey Jason I just gotta stop you real quick you, you're uh you're uh on amp you hit uh, the mute button accidentally so the people I, so here's the problem and I hope people are enjoying this <laughs> uh here's the problem my when my phone goes to, so I just have to turn off my phone's display from going dark because oh, when yeah. the phone locks, it does that. Oh, so gee, hold okay. for a brief moment. And All right, I, we're going to hold real quickly on the amp side. I have to hear all this good stuff. I just this is, to turn off auto lock yeah. and we're good. So I believe. Yeah, there I you go. Jason's back, amp. everybody. Give him, some, uh, give him some blue claps. Let's go. Jason. All Let's right. Go. Nothing better than uh, Dan having to edit here, too. So sorry. So sorry. <laughs> this is what we pay him minimum wage for, okay? So stop. All right? So you were saying about his, that he's definitely in the top 12. And I, I would agree with you. Yeah, I think he's top 12. Like, you, again, you could make a list and you, you could argue over it, but he's not outside the top 15, I don't think, the, with the way people treat him and the way people pitch him. I don't – if if you – a tying run is at the plate and it's blank he's got to be in the top 50 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, another guy that's in that list in my opinion is is pete alonzo um 
he came out the other day. He was doing a radio interview up in New York with Carton and Roberts. And he came out and he said, listen, I've won two straight home run derbies. I will only participate in a third straight one in Los Angeles if I get voted in as a starter. And he's one of the two that you can vote for. It's him and Goldschmidt. Do you think that was just kind of tongue in cheek or are you really buying that Pete Alonso will not try to become the first three time three first guy to win three straight home run derbies? Uh, two pieces of that. Number one, I think he loves it too much to not participate. Mm-hmm. I've done those the last couple of years, the stat cast side on ESPN two. Uh-huh. I think he adores that way too much to not participate. I also think he's competitive enough to want to win every time and feel like maybe taking a break wouldn't be the worst thing. But I think the majority of why he said that is he wants the votes. Like if you say, I'm not going to be in the Derby unless you vote me in as a starter, everybody wants to watch him like rip off his shirt at the Derby and win again. (laughs) So that's it. He's just trolling for votes. He's campaigning. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's all it is. I mean, if the, the home run derby was created for Pete Alonso. He was, it, and this would be the equivalent of, I don't know if you're a wrestling fan at all. If the Miz said, you know what? I'm not going to participate in the Royal Rumble because I didn't get the draw that I wanted. I didn't get the number that I wanted. Like, bullshit. I'll see you there. I'll see you there, Miz. You'll be doing your thing. And Pete Alonso loves this. And he knows that nobody has ever won this three straight times. And he has a chance to do it and to do it in Los Angeles in a place where the Mets are hated. Of course he wants to do it. I think like, I don't, you know, I don't know how religious anybody is, but like if Pete Alonso died and went to heaven, I think heaven would be the home run derby. (laughs) Like, I think that's what it is for him. He loves that so much. He does. He wants to, he wants to bust out the latest polar bear chain. You know, he wants to win that. Like, nobody wants to win this thing more than him. I ain't buying it. We'll see you out there. And I do wish him luck. I want to see him. Like, I understand that he wants to start the All-Star game. But when you look and see Paul Goldschmidt, like, P. Alonzo might even be going on MLB.com and saying, yeah, Paul Goldschmidt's my vote. He's really good. (laughs) He's really good. All right, let's move on. For the first time since the opening series of the season, the Boston Red Sox and New York Yankees will tango. It'll be a four-game series. Up in Boston should be a lot of fun. Before I get to that, at um, were you taken aback by Chris Sale's reaction after what might probably be his final rehab start, where he uh, let's just say he redecorated the minor league clubhouse? Yeah, that was. Um, there's no confirmation that it could be somebody in a Chris Sale jersey who's just as tall. We can't see the face. So yep. if I if the call on the fit, well, now we can. I didn't see the end of it. <laughs> Uh, I didn't see the end of it. I just saw the thrashing. So now that's enough evidence to overturn. I right? can't like, see his eyes there, Jason. I'm, I've watched a lot of Law and Order. I'm not so sure that's going to stand up. Hey, Sailor, he is the most competitive baseball person. Like, I, I, I hate what he did there, right? Like, minor league people spend a lot of time and money putting things together to make a minor league clubhouse look good. I spent 10 years in minor league baseball. If somebody went thrashing around the minor league baseball clubhouse, there are interns who have to clean that up. So like, I'm not really down with that, but I will say Chris Sale is one of the most competitive people I've ever been around. He hated losing when I was around him with the Sox for a couple of years, the White Sox, he hates losing more than just about anybody I have ever met. And so I get where he's coming from and I understand Chris Sale. I also don't appreciate that people have like, there are people making not very much money who have to clean all that stuff up. And I don't even know, like, was it like the, the Worcester go from their first season or like, I don't know what painting it was that got thrown around, but that could be irreplaceable minor league baseball uh, chachis. That's a good point, man. Um, my guess is he will scratch a check and, <laughs> and take care of all the interns. At least he should. Right. I mean, he needs to do that. Can we say that? Yeah, he absolutely does. I mean, that's and I think knowing Chris, I think he'll take care of it. Like, yeah. it'll be one of those like, oh, I once again, I let my emotions get the best of me. And here are, you know, five new paintings for your clubhouse, whatever. But yeah, I I don't like that people have to go do that today. Um, do we have any word if the uniforms are still intact? Hey, now. Hey, now. <laughs> I, uh, I was just I was doing a peacock game. Uh, with uh, the Marlins and the Mets. 
and right. Max Scherzer. So our one of a member of our crew who shall remain nameless uh, had a, a luggage issue, and so walked in wearing a shirt and tie and uh, shorts into Buck's office. And the person knew that he was going to get a bunch of jokes. But Buck told us this story about how a member of the Mets staff walked into the clubhouse the other day with shorts on, and Max Scherzer found the guy's pants and may or may not have cut hearts into the pants and then cut a check for new pants for that. That's event. beautiful. Yeah. God, oh I love, I love how immature the baseball world is, but it's like, it's, it's kind of amazing too, because, you know, in corporate America, we do wall climbing for team building or like retreats. Right. But I do think there's something about that that brings people closer very yes. oddly and when you spend 162 straight days or 180 or whatever it is with off days, you, the mind wanders is, is how I would put it. <laughs> would you do a trust fall with Steve Stone? Oh, my God. I, uh, yes, I would, uh, in part because I don't think he wants to break in another partner. <laughs> hey boy, Steve, you got me. That's funny. That's, Steve Stone, good Clevelander, by the way. Former brush art and a great dude. And I think like, I think at his core, he's a really sentimental guy. He just doesn't like showing people yeah. it. Like we just did the 40th anniversary of his first broadcast mm -hmm. and he was super touched. I think if you asked him if he would handle the trust ball well, he would say, we'll find out. But I think he would absolutely <laughs> be a good friend there. Uh, by the way, I believe Steve Stone started the all-star game the last time it was in Los Angeles in 1980. He did, and there's great footage of him facing J.R. Richard. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, of him hitting. Yeah, well, hitting, right? right. Like, like if if he if the batter's box were a plane, he's in 39F. <laughs> That's a great call. It got me to the bigger question, and let's put the sales stuff to bed. It, there's a 14 game difference between the Yankees and the Red Sox. I mean, it is a Grand Canyon s gap at this point. How much do you care about this series? I care a lot because of the arc of the season of the Red Sox. Because the first month, and we saw him with the White Sox very early in the year, Trevor Story wasn't hitting the whole deal. Like that team was a shell of itself. And the reason for their deficit is that first month. I think there's a chance they run into each other in the playoffs again. And I think this is just the beginning of them sizing each other up. I think the Red Sox are a very good team, personally. Mm -hmm. I think I they're going to hit. I, I like them. I think they're going to make the playoffs. And so as a prelude for what might be in the postseason like they were last year, I actually do care a lot. It's not must-see, and it hasn't been for a while. It just, it just hasn't been. And I don't know if it's because I've got Red Sox-Yankee fatigue. Um, I think they're both really good teams. Obviously, the Yankees are right up there with the Astros and the Dodgers, as, in my opinion, the three best teams in baseball. Uh, and I do believe that the – Red Sox are a team that you're not going to want to see come October, depending on the health of Chris Sale. But, like, is it a must-see four-game series for me? No. I mean, I want to see how the fans react to Garrett Cole for the first time since the playoff game. I want to see if Nasty Nestor can continue to be great with that short wall and left that I keep hearing about. You know, all that sort of stuff. I mean, it's interesting, but it's not. I'm not, like, glued. Well, let me ask you this. If the Red Sox win the first two – are the next two must see for the ramifications publicly for the Yankees? No, to me, the bigger question is, well, I'm not even so sure the Yankees are going to finish with the best record in the American league. And that hasn't, that's nothing. People are like, Oh, you Yankee hater. No, go look at the schedule, dude. Go see who the Houston Astros have to play the rest of the year. Like they don't, there's no other competitive team in the AL West. Go not play. right now. No, there's not. I love the Rangers might, pick it up a little bit if they make a trade or something but the angels are are a hot mess seattle fine whatever but th there's too many how many easy games are there in the american league east when the baltimore orioles who have become i'm not gonna say good who have become remarkably average this year are the worst team in the division that's a tough schedule they're the orioles are fun and that Fun. bullpen is actually really good. They have yeah. stuff in that bullpen. Yes, and I think do. Brandon Hyde's done a magnificent job. I, it is a much tougher division, and I could easily see the Astros being the one seed in the American mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. But I also think 
that if the Red Sox win the first two or the first three of the series and people start to say, well, typical Yankees, right? Like, and anybody can make anything typical Yankees if they can go far, far back enough. I think, you know, 58 and 22 or whatever they are, 58 and 23, like people are going to start to get angry in Yankee uh, Dome if they lose a bunch to the Red Sox. They just are. Well, and they that, are because that's kind they, of fun to watch. Yeah, they just lost consecutive games to Cleveland and Pittsburgh. And they were like, oh, my God, what's going on here? Yes. So, OK, maybe I'll give you if they win the first two Saturday, if I'm not busy, I might come in Sunday. I've got something scheduled at four o'clock Pacific time. You got plans? You got plans yeah, my, on Saturday? Uh, my wife wants to hang out with me. And when you've been married almost 25 years and your wife is like, we're going out. I'm like, yeah, that's why I'm growing this shitty beard, by the way. She likes it. So this is it. To this be clear, you're growing the shitty beard or you have grown a shitty beard. I, I think it's magnificent right now. But if you're trying to make it worse, uh, good luck to you. <laughs> the re- the last time I grew a beard, <clears throat> I was allowed to dye it. She said, you're not allowed to dye it right now. I think you look like a pitching coach. <laughs> you got to see my stroll out to the mound. It is, it is exceptionally slow. I rank in the bottom 8% of strolls to the mound. Really? Of, oh, yeah. Fat ass. You can't tell by sitting down. Childbirthing hips on this guy. It's not pretty. Dan Rourke can tell you in person. So can Sam Singer, our intern. All right, let's move on. Braves got another gem from Max Fried, whom I think we will see in his hometown of Los Angeles, California, on the 19th, pitching in the All-Star game. Uh, Three-nothing win over St. Louis. Dansby Swanson took an over, but that shouldn't take away from his remarkable season that he has had. Let's remember, local kid, uh, has had some ups and downs, is a world champion, and is, is in his walk year. Do you think the Braves have made a mistake not locking him up? It depends on how much you think goodwill costs and how much it is valued. But I do think he is not happening in a vacuum here. And the Freddie Freeman situation informs this situation. So we've seen all the Freddie Freeman stuff and wherever you come down on that, fine. But if you lose a couple guys who are hometown heroes, I think at some point the fans start to say, hey, it's just a business or whatever. And if you lose games when you've lost those guys, I think Goodwill has some value that they probably should think about locking up just because of what they've dealt with with Freddie Freeman. But I would say uh, with all the shortstops who seem to be rotating through and the possibility of Carlos Correa being a free agent and all of that, I, if it was just Dansby Swanson and the Freeman stuff hadn't happened, I could see it. But I also think now you, you kind of have to have somebody who's an anchor, right? Gosh, a year ago, would you have said Dansby Swanson and anchor in the same sentence? No, I, I no. And and I it's not even that he's the best hitter in the lineup, but he's so beloved as a local guy. And I just think having some of that is really valuable. And he's I, still a very good player. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that this year it's peak levels for him. I mean, this right. is way above. It's it's like 50 points above in batting average. It's over 100 in OPS in terms of his career numbers. Now, he has had some decent years, but there have been times where Braves fandom has been like, enough of this guy. Like, take your beautiful hair somewhere else. Like, we have had enough. Now, you mentioned Correa, who we, we both think is going to opt out after this year, right? He's, He's got to. Okay. I, I, not, I mean, he, he doesn't have to, but like, why wouldn't you? Right. I, Everything is that he has created something better in Minnesota. He's a lot of the reason why they're better. Yes. Yes, he's opting out. Um, he can say whatever he wants. He's opting out. He needs to. Uh, so the other one is Trey Turner. And then there's a m- massive drop-off after Dansby Swanson in terms of shortstop. So, you know, what's your? You know, you could pay Dansby Swanson. Let's come up with a figure. $90 million? Or you could go... 200 for Trey Turner. Yeah. And you get, I mean, maybe you can get yourself a hometown discount. Like, I, I don't know what it looks like, but yeah, I think with the Freeman stuff, they could get eviscerated. I agree. I agree there. And it's, 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 it's a, I'm happy you brought up that point. See, I usually don't get this from Ploop. It's very much surface stuff with him. Here you are digging another layer. It's like the, the, that Neapolitan ice cream. There's extra stuff underneath. And then I'm like, Oh wow. There's that color too. Good job. 
All right, last thing here on the YouTube and the uh, podcast uh, form of the show. Matt Chapman, nice little return to Oakland, kind of heartwarming for him. And then when he took James Caprillian deep, we really got deep into the story and found out that Caprillian had officiated Chapman's off-season wedding and was the DJ as well. Um, if, if one of your best friends does something like that to you, do you then charge him for everything you did in the wedding that was once free? Oh, absolutely. You do everything you can to, in a small way, sabotage the best day of his life. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like, that's unquestionably true just because you can. Did you see how mad he was when he turned around? Oh yeah, I think he gave it a big fuck. Yeah, there was no, there was no friend going on there. There was just like angry face. And so I think like he's trying to figure out how he might be able to turn back time. And I, I, I kind of wish that it was coming up, like the wedding was going to happen. Because I think then like he starts playing really bad songs. Like you, you just play like, I don't know, the same song on loop, like Miracle oh. by Vertical Horizon, like 30 times in a row or something <laughs> like that. And see if you can get yourself fired. So I wish it was going to happen, but yeah, you send him a bill and maybe you like try to talk to the photographer and you play a prank and you say, hey, will you just let him know that the, the wedding photos didn't really come out like you wanted or there are only like 20 and there was supposed to be 300 and you just let him go through what you felt when he took you deep. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's the second major leaguer I've heard of in the last uh you know, 10 days or so that officiated a teammate's wedding or a good friend's wedding. We had Rowdy Telez on the Chris Rose rotation of the Brewers. He officiated Danny Jansen's wedding. Really? He was talking to him. Oh, yeah. He said, I, there was no question I was going to do it. I cried during the whole thing. I had a hard time getting stories out. He goes, but it was like one of the best things I've ever done. So maybe this is like a nouveau sort of thing. So I, I have to say, I was asked a couple years ago to officiate a friend's wedding, but it was it. during baseball season. And so because of baseball, I couldn't. So it's like the opposite of what they're dealing with. Yeah, you would be great. You know what? This should be an off-season gig. Not that you have an off-season because, you know, you do so many other sports. But you could do it. It would be like uh, finding a new business, uh, kind of like Cameo. You could be hired to do, a, you know, wedding officiating. So, so I was gonna, I was gonna say that, and then you said cameo. What, what would the cameo for wedding officiant be called, right? I um, think we're on to something. I think we just started a new business. Like you could totally hire celebrity. I think I'm gonna start this right afterward. Nobody that's listening on Amp steal this, please. Mon let's. I don't see any blue hands, so I don't know. Maybe they're all <laughs> going to like the trademark <laughs> office or something right now, and they can't, they can't blue hand. The hands are busy. Um, Hey, so obviously we can see you for first of four tonight against the Tigers. And then Sunday, where are you for Peacock? Sunday, we got Orioles, Angels. Okay. A lot of storylines, at least. Yeah, it's, I, I've seen them both recently. They're, they're interesting teams in two ways, for sure. And I got the great Ben McDonald and Mark Gubaza with. Me. Oh, that'll be fun. That'll right. be fun. Two 80s legends. I like that. Um so for those of you joining us uh, via podcast form and uh, on our YouTube channel, I want to give a big old thank you so much to Jason Benetti for hanging out with us today. Great job. I mean, I'm going to be calling you again because Ploof takes a vacation like every 12 days. I just want to let you know. Well, he's the ever vacationing Trevor Ploof now. He used to be ever dangerous. Now he's ever not on the <laughs> podcast. He will love that. He will love hearing that as he listens on his private jet back from uh, Cabo to Los Angeles. Special shout out to our producer extraordinaire, the one and only Dan Rourke, and our summer intern, the sleepyhead, Sam Singer. I am Chris Rose for Jason Benetti. We will see you Friday. Ploof is back in the chair for Baseball Today.